The Declaration is by far the most important document in our history. It not only legally created the United States, but it infused into our culture these values that we still honor, equality and liberty. It's our adhesive. It's the only thing we've got. The United States of America is arguably the first nation in human history to be consciously created on the basis of Enlightenment ideals. Those ideals were captured in equal parts with power and poetry in the Declaration of Independence 250 years ago. At its worst, the Declaration can be called hypocritical for a soon-to-be nation that enslaved 20% of its population. Yet at its best, the truths it held to be self-evident can be seen as transformational aspirations that uniquely set America on a course to make the first case for slavery's abolition and create the freest and most prosperous land in human history. That's certainly how Martin Luther King saw it. Very seldom, if ever, in the history of the world has a socio-political document expressed in such profound, eloquent, and unequivocal language, the dignity and the worth of human personality. King understood our history in a deep and profound way. It's a vision that has animated millions of people to immigrate to this country seeking a better life. In my experience, you'll find no greater champions of the American ideal than first-generation immigrants. The same, tragically, cannot be said for the rest of us. According to a recent poll by the Wall Street Journal, patriotism has utterly collapsed as an important value for most Americans. Look no further than our failing education system for one major culprit. Nationwide tests found that only 13% of eighth graders met proficiency standards for US history, and only 22% scored proficient in civics. This reminds me of a famous quote often attributed to Thomas Jefferson himself. An educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. By that measure, we are failing future generations. And that's why I am so excited about today's guest, Gordon Wood. He is one of the world's leading experts on America's revolutionary history and currently a professor at Brown University. Throughout his storied career, Gordon has earned a Pulitzer Prize, a National Humanities Medal, and the Bancroft Prize. He's even become somewhat of a pop culture icon, being mentioned in both Goodwill Hunting and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. That's gonna last until next year. You're gonna be in here regurgitating Gordon Wood. Does no one know who Gordon Wood is? People ask, what is an American? What can you say? He said, well, we believe in equality. We believe in liberty. I mean, that's how we define ourselves. I think most people do. They don't refer to an ethnic base. So in that sense, it's become the basis for the country, that set of principles. Gordon has authored, co-authored, and contributed to dozens of books on the American Revolution, including his award-winning titles, The Creation of the American Republic and The Radicalism of the American Revolution. This Independence Day, or any day for that matter, I can think of no better guide to the origin story and enduring legacy of the United States of America than Gordon Wood. Gordon Wood, welcome to Dad Saves America. Glad to be here. <laughs> One of the things that we try to do with the show is explore the issues that, you know, our kids need to know about if they want to succeed and if they want to contribute to the success of the country, however that might be defined. And I think that, you know, we're coming up on the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, and hopefully this conversation will actually go live during the 4th of July. So the Declaration is this, is this moment in American history. It's like a defining moment. At least that's the way we all celebrate it every 4th. And I want to read something that you wrote in your book, uh, The Radicalism of the American Revolution, which we have here, that I think tees off our conversation really, really great. You wrote that the Declaration of Independence was the most powerful manifesto of democratic revolution ever written and it succeeded beyond the wildest dreams of those who participated in it. So what did you mean by powerful? Well, influential, and, and how important it became to, to Americans. It, it was not what they thought. The people who wrote it had no idea it would become as important as it, it turned out to be. Jefferson was not really known as the author until probably the 19, 1780s. And then in the 90s, it was picked up by uh, the 
new Republican Party, which he was heading, or one of the leaders of, and then he became aware that it, this was an important document. And if, if John Adams had known how important it would become, he would have written it himself. Interesting. He, he was so jealous of Jefferson, who developed this fame. And it really isn't until 1817, I think, uh, Ezekiel uh, Niles, who was the greatest journalist of the period, wrote an open public letter to Jefferson saying, Mr. Jefferson, we are such a diverse people. Already he thought we were diverse with so many different kinds of people living here. You need to, to make something of the Declaration and, and its principles to hold us together. And Jefferson came to realize that the Declaration was, was really his, his claim to fame. Uh, he lists it as number one of his accomplishments on his gravestone. He had three things he listed, not his presidency, uh, but the Declaration of Independence. And, and he, at this point, he writes his son-in-law and says, save the desk on which, I wrote, on which I wrote the Declaration. It's going to become a, a sacred relic. So it took a while for people to realize just how important that was. And of course, the person who made the most of it is Lincoln. Explain. Lincoln is confronted with a nation that's falling apart. And he wants to, he goes back to the founding to justify his antagonism, his opposition to slavery. And he says, all honor to Mr. Jefferson for the statement that all men are created equal. By this point, equality had taken over the country. And Lincoln uses that, that word, and what it meant to further his position as one of the leading opponents of Southern slavery. But he's the one who, I think, creates the the aura that we have for these founders. Interesting. Because so it's in the, you think it's Lincoln that, that oh, really yeah, because in, congeals everyone, our, our modern sense exactly, of the founders? In, in the antebellum period, in the 1830s or 1840s, when people talked about the founders, they meant the 17th century founders. Uh, John Smith, William Bradford, John Winthrop, William Penn. These are the founders, right. the colonial founders. It's Lincoln who, who really changes the, the meaning of that word founder. And he, he has this wonderful speech with an image that still overawes me, where he says, those men who wrote the Declaration, and he says men at that point, or more than one, the founders, yeah. we people today are flesh of, of the flesh and blood of the blood of the men who wrote that Declaration. And it's an extraordinary statement, because he, he starts by saying, look, we're a very diverse people. We have these French, we have, we have Irish, we have Swedes, we have Scots and English, all of yeah. these. How do diverse we from, that? in the context of a European history. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. He's talking in the 18, late 1850s. Yeah. How do we hold these people together? And it's exactly the same point that Niles had asked Jefferson. We're not a nation like most nations. We don't have an ethnic basis. There's, you know, yeah, it's not a blood and soil country, that's right? right. It's, it's, I mean, it's the French like, know oh. who a Frenchman is, and the, <laughs> the English know who an Englishman is. But an American, there's no ethnic basis to that. To be an American is, is not to be somebody, but to believe in something. You know, so what do we believe in? Those things that came out of the Declaration. So uh, we're going to touch on a lot of stuff in this conversation. I'm, and, and I'm going to save uh, our conversation about slavery uh, for a little later because it's really important for us to talk about, sure. especially in the context of all men created equal. It's like right, this right. contradiction right from the start. But I think the other thing I want to ask is, is you know, in this first statement that I, I read, you say that it succeeded. Now, in a sense, it's obvious that it succeeded because the American colonists won the, the war against the British. But in, is, is that sense of success how else did it succeed? It seems like you meant more than just like we won the war in terms of the success of the declaration as a document. What well, does that mean to succeed? It's the basis of our culture, of our, of our nationhood. If people ask, what is an American? What can you say? He said, well, we believe in equality. We believe in liberty. I mean, that's how we define ourselves. I think most people do. They don't, they don't refer to an ethnic base. So in that sense, it's become the basis for the of the country. I think that set of principles. I mean, the Declaration 
is by far the most important document in our history, I mean, bar none. I mean, think of it. It not only legally created the United States, but it infused into our culture these values that, that I think we, we still honor, equality and liberty. So it's our adhesive. It's the only thing we've got. And no other nation is, is, is like ours in that sense. This is one of the things that I've heard <clears throat> said, and I'm so excited to talk to you because it's like, you know, you're one of the preeminent historians of, the, of this time in our, in our history. I have heard it said that the country is based on, that it's the only modern country that was founded on ideas. And this is a very romantic statement. And, and to what extent is that true? Is that, is that a fair statement that America I mean, is? the French also like to claim that they are an enlightened state and they, they don't have any uh, ethnic base, but they do, of course. They can't believe that these Arabs who've been living there for three generations are really French. We know what a Frenchman's like. So I think we are the only nation that really, there are empires, that are, you know, Ottoman Empire had many diverse peoples, yeah. but that was an empire. But as a nation, we are the only ones, really, I think, based on a, on a set of ideas. You said of the founders, of the founding fathers who drafted the Declaration of Independence were radicals, who believed that the old order was corrupt and that a new society based on the principles of democracy and freedom was necessary. What, what did you mean by that? When you say radical, what does that word mean? Well, there are degrees, of course. Uh, John Adams wasn't as radical He's radical in that he would wanted to break from Great Britain, but he wasn't as radical as Jefferson was in wanting to change the society. Jefferson had a whole set of reforms. In fact, many of them had reform. In the states, almost coinciding with, with 1776, even before the Declaration, the, the states were beginning to move towards reforming in five areas. Religion, mm -hmm. abolishing the Church of England, setting up some kind of, in most states, there was kind of a collective uh, establishment. Uh, a third was criminal punishment. We didn't have prisons in the colonial period. If you committed a crime, you were either executed, you know, lots of capital crimes, 200 on the books in England, uh, or you suffered mutilation. You did chop off an ear. The old, this is the old, nose. this is some biblical right. stuff. Right. Yeah. There were no prisons, no penitentiaries. We established the first penitentiary. Uh, Pennsylvania took the lead. That became a reform. Now, we don't think about penitentiaries as being reformed, but they were. And, and in Pennsylvania, all the capital crimes were eliminated except for one, for murder. That was really a way ahead of anything that was happening Is in that Europe. true? So the colonies led the way on that c compared the Americans, to, compared to I mean, all of Europe? All of Europe. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're wow. way ahead of that. We, we were seen as an enlightened... I mean, people in Europe looked at this experiment. They saw what was happening, and they saw it as an enlightened experiment in bringing enlightened notions to, to law. So let's see, the religion yeah. is the... Uh, oh, I mentioned religion. Yeah, religion. C criminal punishment and... Um, the a, a state. The... State. And uh, a fourth would have been, uh, of course, anti-slavery. The northern states the first states in the world where slavery was legally established to abolish it. Okay, I want to put a you pin in that. Yeah, yeah, you want to go back to that Because we later. will, we can spend this, and I want to spend enough time really oh, devoted to, vote had, to I, it. Did I mention so, all five? And I think there's a fifth one, right? Oh, education. Once you become a republic, which means the people choose the leaders, you've got to have an educated populace. Every one of the founders, it seems, Jefferson certainly, Benjamin Rush, they draw up plans for public education. Jefferson has a three-tiered plan that's very similar, grammar school, high school, college, all publicly supported. But of course, these things don't get implemented right away, this notion, but the idea is set right from the 1776 on. So you have these people who've been living here in this continent and are reinventing with the, what, the, what it looks like to have a civil society. Like what, what are the rules we're going to live by? And they are breaking from the past. They're drawing really on the Enlightenment. But by the end of the 18th century, Western Europe saw itself as full of these ideas flying around from all over. And, and the Americans become the first people to really implement. They have a chance to implement them. That's why Jefferson's so excited. I mean, he was very widely read, probably the most widely read person in America at the time. 
and, and he, he just was so excited about having the opportunity to implement each of these reforms. Now, he gets frustrated, gets frustrated on, on all of them in some sense, uh, but he tries in every area though, that I mentioned, those five areas, including anti-slavery. You know, when I realized I was going to have the opportunity to talk to you, the first thing I did was go back and say, well, let me actually just read the Declaration sure. of Independence because, gosh, it's probably been since school that I actually sat down and, and read it. And for most of us, if you went out on the street, I think we'd all be sad by whether or not right. <laughs> anyone, we, we could find anyone that said, oh, yeah, I read the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. So I'm going, to, I'm going to read some blocks of it, and I want to talk about some of them. Well, the first two paragraphs people are familiar with, but... The rest of it, probably not. Well, so it's only 1,337 words long, and there were 56 signers. So, but there's, there's all these ideas in this relatively small number of words. So right at the top, and this is a little bit of a block of text, but I want to read it word for word. We'll put it up on the screen. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So my first question about this is, is this the first use of this name? The United States of America? Where does this... Well, they had talked about the United Colonies, but it obviously was not much of a name because it, <laughs> and they later sort of wrestled it. with it, but it's all they could come up with at that point because they really are very separate states. And they say that later in the, uh, in the Declaration, as you, you get to the end, they read, they are 13 independent states with the independent right to do this and that. And this first one, I think, is showing the world, look, we're, we're a nation now. We're one people. But to call us one people was quite bold for Jefferson. But he's announcing to the world the powers of the earth. We are going to be an equal to you guys. That's what he's essentially saying in that first paragraph. It seems like he's also setting up to his a, a beginning of the justification of this document. Right? Yeah, like, sure. Like this why? is why we're announcing it. We're telling the world we're coming to be one of the competing powers of the earth. We've arrived. It's a statement of, of declaration of here we are, folks. What did the word state mean at that time? Because you are. Well, they are their colonies. And I guess this is sort of an early time for the development of the nation state, right, as a concept? Well, or, they, they, put this they, word in context. They, the term nation state, I think, is, I'm not sure when that would be invented. But a state was. England was a state, and or Great Britain was a state, France was a state. So here we have 13 states. The states are really very independent. Well, that's it's what's like so the in EU. That's the best way to think of it. You've got 13 states, each of them thinking to themselves, we're, I'm, we're sovereign, we can do what we want. I'm a Pennsylvania. Well, we, I'm a, I'm and a they do form a treaty, you know, right after the Declaration. It takes a little while, but by 1777, they draw up a treaty. It doesn't get ratified until 80. 1781, but it's a treaty among 13 independent states. It's like the EU. What's that treaty? Forms the Articles of Confederation. Okay. So, um, uh, and so that's the best way to think of the United States of the outside. It has a, it has a literal meaning that it has been lost. I, I, the Civil War, after the Civil War, we became the United States is. Prior to the Civil War, the United States are. Always a plural verb. And I've heard this phrase that these United States. Yes, of course. They, they, it would be like trying to talk about the European states as being one. They, they'd like, many people there would like to be more united than they are, but they still <laughs> are quite different. And I think you can better understand the beginnings of the United States if you think of it as in, you know, similar to the present day EU. How on board? were these 13 states to this document well, at the got, time they, that they it's... They got them all to vote, and it's unanimous. Uh, but I think there were probably more loyalists in the middle colonies, the middle states, uh, New York and New Jersey, than elsewhere. Virginia had very few loyalists. Massachusetts had some, but not very many. 
it's the middle states in New York and New Jersey and that area that had... They were on the fence? You know, yeah, they had a little more diversity. It was more ethnically mixed, and that created some problems. But no, it, but the, the people who are loyal really... Uh, the, this is where the, the Brits miscalculate. They think there's more loyalists than there are. Maybe at best, 20% of the population was loyalist. Uh, the population at the time of the revolution is two and a half million people, 500,000 of whom are African slaves. And of those, I would say 20% were loyalists. They really thought that they had a lot of people who would support the crown, and they were just... Uh, flabbergasted at their lack of support. When Burgoyne goes through New York, he, he just can't, you know, he's coming down the Hudson Valley, he just can't recruit people. So are you saying that, that the king thought that he'd be greeted as liberators? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, well, not quite that, but <laughs> they thought they were putting down a small group of factious people in Massachusetts. They just miscalculated how much support uh, there was for the, for the cause. Okay, I want to move, move through the sure. text a little bit more because here comes the part that I think most people are familiar with. And that is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's a lot of ideas I, in yeah. here and I want to break them down with, with you, Gordon Wood. So the first, why are these Self-evident? What's that claim about? Well, how are you going to go proving these things? Why don't you say it's self-evident? I mean, Jefferson never claimed that this was original with him. He's just sort of putting forth what he thought was conventional wisdom among people who thought like him, enlightened gentlemen. And I think there's no way of proving all this. It's just that this is what we all know, self-evident. And then he refers to sort of a natural basis to rights. Actually, most of the rights they thought about all through the debate that leads up to the Declaration are English rights. I mean, that's what they're talking about. And those English rights were quite considerable, and they're important. But you can't keep talking about English rights if you're going to break from England. So yeah. they begin talking about natural rights. What does that mean, It's in nature. Rights. Nature is what ought to be. It's the best. It's what's natural, that's an enlightened presumption. When you, when you refer to nature, you're referring to something that's what should be. I know that this life, liberty, property, what Jefferson has written here rhymes a lot with John Locke. Of so course. Is he, so, so, Locke was very important to these so people. Help me understand, well, what was John Locke's fundamental argument that seemed to make, well, have such Locke sway? Locke is a very, very radical thinker of the 18th century. You don't have to have read John Locke to reach the idea that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness are it. But it certainly did re resemble Locke's life, liberty, and property he is. Now, the pursuit of happiness was a wonderful, nice change. And, uh, and a weird change. It's like a well, flourish, happiness, right? Happiness is, is being celebrated in the enlightened, among enlightened circles. And, and they're now talking about happiness as something that we are owed, that we can have happiness in a way that hadn't been done in medieval times. So, so that's not so strange that he should invoke happiness. The creation of, you know, all men are created equal. That's a big one. Well, and and here's, a, here's a question about that. You know, and, and it's pairing with this notion of, 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 nat of n natural rights. I look around the world, I look around my neighborhood, people aren't equal. I'm like, I'm not the strongest, I'm not the tallest, I'm not the smartest. They aren't, so he isn't saying all people are equal, he says all people are created equal. And that's a very enlightened notion. The, it again goes back to, to Locke's phil philosophical position of, of, uh, that we're born as a blank slate and what differences occur as we mature come from experience, through our senses. So inequality arises through experience. But we're all born with that same blank slate. In other words, to be enlightened at this point is to believe that entirely in nurture, not nature. You have to understand the revolution. So that's the this way they were. What's radical thinking. about it? Revolution is a repudiation of blood. Up to this point, 
the aristocracies in Europe had always assumed that they were superior because it flowed through their blood. I yeah, mean, that's the whole blood. idea of monarchy, after all. And this is a repudiation of that. What matters is what you do with your life. You're born the same as anyone else. They even a applied this to, to, to blacks, Africans. Many enlightened people trying to explain why are some people black. Well, they were in Africa, the sun is hot, it scorched their skin. And if brought to a more temperate climate, they would become white over time. They actually thought that in those terms. Climate becomes a very important part of this environment that affects people. So the idea of all men are created equal means they're all born the same blank slate on which is etched their, through experience, coming from the senses, is in that etched. And what you make of yourself, that's why education becomes so important to this generation. Education wouldn't be important to people who feel, well, you're born, whatever you're born with, you're going to stay the same the rest of your life anyhow. It's quite a utopian position to take that we're born as blank slates, isn't it? And I mean, well, I, mean that, I mean that, I guess, in a positive sense. It's like looking that, to like, the perfection the, the of the world. That's the gist of Locke's uh, philosophical works. That's what he says. It's a radical position, but, but, but it seemed to people to be liberating, as you can well imagine. If, if we are all the same, then we can change the environment and then enable people to have a better chance at, at developing. But the original conception, all men are created equal, is this Lockean point of, of uh, blank slate with experience etching your, what you are. So that they could account for, they knew that people were not the same, but uh, they wanted to uh, break from this the aristocratic notion that blood mattered and that you were born to be what you are and it's too late. I mean, they always had this notion that if they saw a, a handsome child uh, in, in the poverty, they, that, that kid had to be the offspring of an aristocrat. You know, in other words, <laughs> a bastard child thrown out into the... They, they, yeah. That's the way they thought. I want to I want to get a little semantic and dig into some other things like all men. So we're sitting here. It's 2023. Um, you hear all men, and you know my son's generation with, with their backs will stiffen. So did this was this colloquial for all people, or was it more specific? Because women couldn't vote. Women didn't have equal rights. I don't think they were thinking. Oh my God, we we're not including women in this, but they certainly did not expect women to become political leaders or to engage in, but they're too dependent. People who are dependent, and that's children up to age of yeah. 21, and women are denied the suffrage because they're dependent on someone else. And they cannot have a will of their own, as Blackstone, the great English jurist, put it. They could not have a will of their own. So that's the rationale. And uh, most women accepted that role. Uh, they had their own s skills and own talents and so on, but there, there's a beginning of some kind of feminist spokesman. Mary Wollstonecraft, the English, wrote a book in the 1790s on the rights of women. There was a woman in uh, Judy Sargent Murray in America who wrote in the 80s and 90s, 1780s and 90s, feminist, uh, the beginnings of it. Is it a fair reading to say that all men are created equal was meant to mean all of humanity? Yes, yes. I think they meant all human beings. Before I move on to the next part of the Declaration, you've talked about the Scottish Enlightenment. And so Adam Smith has, it, it has two books that are, that are happening basically yeah, at the right. same time. The, the, the Wealth of Nations. Which right. I think it came out in 76. It's kind of, yes. I was, I was like, the I remember book this? came out earlier. And then, and the, then the Theory of Moral Sentiments. So, sentiments is, is very much in the line of the, socio the social sociability uh, argument. Right. Well, he's just, he's well, just this... another version of that. Hutchison, his colleague, Francis Hutch Hutchison, is making the same point. Yeah, this is the thing that I find interesting is a good friend of mine, Russ Roberts, who's got a great Econ Talk podcast that Liberty Fund hosts, uh, he's pointed to this phrase from Smith that man not only wants to be loved, but to be lovely, to be worthy of love. It's, right. it's a kind of um, early evolutionary psychology that our empathy, our love, our, our goodness 
is useful to us. It be, we, we evolve in groups, and so we, we want to be good to each other, and the state gets in the way of that. That's right. It's, it's very hard to explain why radicals in the <laughs> late 18th century should be such uh, anti-state, but that comes from the, mo the notion of monarchy. Monarchy is a corrupt, interfering force that prevents us from this natural flow. I mean, think of the French trilogy in their revolution. What's it called? It was a, what was it, liberty, equality, and fraternity, right? Fraternity. That's it, right? Yeah. What's one of the great institutions of this period that's transatlantic? Freemasonry. What is Freemasonry but fraternity? People coming together. And, and so a lot so of. So for the kid that only knows the word fraternity by oh, yeah. uh, college parties, yeah, but what they know does what fraternity it mean? mean? It means that brotherhood, coming together and treating each other friend as friends. You know, friends, even strangers coming together. That was the beauty of Freemasonry. And it explodes in America are the in these years. This is a little bit of a tangent, but since these are some things that I think people hear in the popular culture, Freemason is something that sounds like a conspiracy theory. Well, it so didn't become that. <laughs> so, so what was that, and were, the found, were, were many of the founders or framers part of this fraternity? Some of them were, and some of them disliked it. I mean, Washington really love being a Freemason and go to the meetings. It, it was a way, it's a kind of surrogate religion for lots of people who really weren't prepared to go and bear their souls in church. But they want the, the congregationalness of, of life, of a religious life, and, and the Freemasonry offered that for them. It has these little secret things and it's handshake and all, but once you, you brought people from different walks of life together, in a kind of equal basis. It doesn't matter who you were, or what your background was, and you came together and, and celebrated your, your brotherhood, so to speak. So it does have relationship to fraternity, and, and the term fraternity, as college kids would know, does have that notion of brotherhood. Okay, I want to move on to the next part. Yeah, yeah. So here's a, this is a big block. I'm going to make sure I read it correctly. So we've come out of, uh, you know, all men are created to equal, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as they shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. There's that word happiness again. Yeah. So we've talked about this already, but this notion that the sovereignty, that the people actually have right. a right to overthrow, right. overthrow their government. Yeah. I mean, we got, he, he still got a king. So there, there is a sense of where yeah, is he but, getting this from? Well, like, even the... Even the <laughs> where is he getting this out, from? Like, first of all, they have to understand they're coming out of an English tradition, which is already radical. I mean, there's no country like England in Europe. I mean... Explain you, that. Well, the English are at the radical edge, if you will. And they are marked as such. I mean, the French see the English as being crazy. They, they, have, they don't have the distinctions that we have and so on. And the English took great pride. Uh, you know, as Hogarth prints and so show in, in John Bull uh, and his beer and beef eating, we're a real people and we're, we believe in equality. They would actually talk about they were more equal to each other than the French were. And so y Americans are kind of extreme Englishmen, which is what Burke pointed out. We are so libertarian that we snuff tyranny in every breeze. And with the descent of dissidents, I mean, we just were so radical compared to the English. But the English are already radical. And George III says liberty is at the basis of our Constitution. I mean, so the English celebrate liberty first before we do, so to speak. We are the heirs of that liberal English tradition. So who else existed at the time for us to well, get a France, sense of the context? Russia, the Germans are no state yet, just a bunch of principalities. And it, the same is true of Italy. But France is the other dominant power. And France is a Catholic power, strong, centralized, a monarchy. Russia, of course, is a way off in the east, is a monarchy. Um, there are no 
I mean, there are a few little republics. There's the Dutch, who are kind of a, a half republic. And then you have Venice, a little city, a republic. But there's right. nothing like what's going to be created or is being created in 1776, the United States. Even one of the states like Pennsylvania is a huge block of territory. And right. the idea that you could have 13 of them, that just kind of boggles the mind. There's nothing like that. Uh, in, in Europe at the time. You have to go back to Rome, and that's, they often refer to Rome. And of course, that's an object lesson. We don't want to do it. <laughs> you know, Rome finally fell, so we don't want to get into that problem. And it's a and, sidebar. But and the, there's a lot of talk about republics and how can they sustain, because a republic is a fragile kind of polity, because it's dependent on the people from below. I mean, we have that same issue today. We talk about autocracy which is power from the top down, yeah. much more stable. And you can have a, a, a large territory. They assume that you could only govern a large territory with, with an autocracy. And some people might say, well, that's understandable. Look at Russia. It's such a huge landmass. How else could you govern it except through an autocracy? The idea of a republic, which is, comes from the bottom up, very fragile, very likely to fall apart. So you. you You've got to worry about that. And the Americans, of course, did. I want to get into the, the grievances. But before I do, I want to understand how did these people see themselves? Because here we are, and they're, oh, they're British colonies and they're English subjects. But they've been living across an ocean for 100 right. years, right? So I think the first settlers in Virginia are in 1610s or 1607, something like that. 1607, the colony. You know, that's 1607. So you're talking about 1776 is almost 170 years later. Right. So generate multiple generations have lived in this continent. Right. And built the society that they're living in. Now. But by 1776, it was a pretty flourishing place. There are two and a half million people, England and Scotland, eight or nine million. It, 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 and it's birth rate was doubling every 20 years, faster than any place else in the world. And we could see ourselves, and they knew about it. Franklin talk, talks about this. Demographic growth was enormous. and was a sign of a healthy state. We were, the standard of living was so high, I mean, this, so high that is the available wealth that, that kids get married a year earlier. They get married a year earlier, they have one more kid. We had the highest, uh, probably, uh, fertility rate at least to 1800, when it was measured, was seven. That is, the average woman was women were having seven children. Now, some women didn't have any children, but so others had 14 average. children. So we had a, wow. a fertility rate of seven. And that was just extraordinary. And we were growing so fast that people could anticipate that we would soon overcome Great Britain in size. So there's a sense that we're a strong, flourishing people with real advantages to, to becoming a, a great nation. As we move through the document, I'm, I'm not going to read all the grievances because there's a lot. Uh, there's 27 <laughs> plus grievances that are listed that come next. <laughs> and this is, this is where we get into the meat. This of, is okay. Jefferson, though. You know, you understand, he wrote a pamphlet, the most radical pamphlet in 1774 called Summary View of the, of the Crisis. It's more radical than anything until Thomas Paine. Common Sense, which came out in January of 76. Jefferson already th throws out his grievances against the crown. He, he throws everything but the kitchen sink in there. And to some extent, it's a, a put-up thing. I mean, just looking for anything. I can, if he hears that there was some North Carolina, some issue in North Carolina with the royal governor, well, I'll, I'll put it in. I mean, the basic issue is, is buried in it, the taxation issue. Well, this is what I wanted to ask you about, because as I'm reading this, I'm like, where's the taxation? Yeah, right it's buried. You've you got to wait almost two-thirds of the I way know, down I the know. list. Because Jefferson <laughs> just, he, what he's just, he tries to throw everything in. In fact, the original draft, he blames George III for slavery in America. You have brought all these people in. And of course, that was too much for his colleagues. That was just such a well. mischaracterization, and they took it out because they, they realized that it was just embarrassing. It would be too embarrassing. But Jefferson's just looking for everything he can think of put in. But the basic point is control. That taxation was just one element. If they can tax us, they can, can 
they can hurt us. If they can do anything that we don't consent to, we don't want it. And so by the time he's writing, the colonists had reached a position in the imperial debate that they were tied only to the king, not to parliament. What else is happening on the ground? Is it, is it really a war going on already? <laughs> well, well, right, so set the stage for if I'm a Pennsylvanian or a Virginian, and I'm sure the differences are vast in these different states, why would this be animating me? Is it really like, oh, you taxed my tea, so we're going to go to war? You mean in 1776 or earlier during? In the lead up to it. Is it the quartering, the having British troops? Yeah, is there a lot of the strife tax, happening? The, the idea that they could be taxed by Britain that is their property taken away. That electrifies the colonies. So it really they, is. They, We're like the anti-tax oh, country right, right, right away. Start. Well, it's, no, <laughs> but the implications of it. If you can take, you can tax us just a little bit, then you can tax. Legally, you can take more and more. And we would have no control. How, how are we going to stop the parliament? Now, the Brits say, oh, well, maybe we'll give you 100 members. They don't want that. Because that's what they did to Scotland, the Scottish. Right. Uh, brought in in the Act of Settlement in the beginning of the 18th century, they had given 100 members in Parliament. Well, they, the, the Americans don't want that. I mean, it's suggested by, even by Franklin, he, naively, he didn't quite understand how it's... Yeah. How much of what's happening is, is about being separated by the Atlantic? How oh, much of it important. is it just like there's this giant distance that takes months during which time there's a good chance you'll die yeah, yeah, they're, they're, to come back and forth. But there's a book written about that. If they had modern communications, things might have been different. I, I'm not sure. The British, they don't really understand what's happening. They're, too many of the officials are ignorant of the colonists. And they, they're worried about them. They're the ones who talk about independence. These colonists are going to become independent. And they refer to them as Americans well before the colonists call themselves Americans. It's okay, so British, who, who who starts the, the British colonies? officials referring to this vast array of colonies they have over there in this continent that's called North America, they refer to them as the Americans. The colonists, we're Virginians, we're from Pennsylvania, right. but they don't see themselves as Americans. It's it's the British actions that create when they have to come together in the Congress then they think of themselves as Americans. So before I move on to this concluding paragraph, I just want to make sure we haven't missed any grievances that are worth talking about besides taxes. Well, the one that was kicked out, <laughs> that they, the Congress took out, was uh, he blamed uh, George III for slavery. But otherwise, he's blaming him for all kinds of things. And, and they're serious, some of them, and some of them are marginal, but he just throws everything he can think of. As I say, it's dumb. Everything about the kitchen sink is in there that he can think of as a grievance to justify this revolution. But the main problem, the underlying thing is, we're not to be controlled by a mother country 3,000 miles away. They were willing to have Great Britain manage their tr uh, international trade. That was one position they Hey, thought. you got that Navy. That's pretty helpful. Yeah, and, and so they had agreed that, you know, the, the British had passed navigation acts. It's an awkward position for them because they'd reached by 1774 that they were tied only to the crown, but then they knew that Britain would want to manage navigation acts, that is, the international trade. So they said, we'll, we'll allow you to do that from the necessity of the case. Huh. I mean, it's a kind of weak concession in a way because it violates their already said parliament has no authority over us, but we're going to let you do this on the side because we think it's probably good for the whole empire. That's the position, that, the last position they made to the Brits. The Brits don't accept that. Now, later, they would. I mean, they, in 1778, when the French come in on our side, the Brits are so frightened by that that they send a commission over here, the Carlisle Commission, to the, to the states, offering them everything, everything they wanted except independence. That very position that we had reached if they'd done that in 74, 75, it would have nipped the... We'd, we'd, be can't, we'd just well, be one big Well, Canada. I'm not sure about that, but it would have <laughs> delayed it. Let's put it this way. It would have delayed it. I think some kind of independence was inevitable because it was such a burgeoning society. And its sense of itself is increasingly confident. It, it couldn't have tolerated any connection unless they, the Brit just left us alone completely. Well, and it is interesting to think... Uh, 
it wouldn't take that long before we were just so much bigger in population. That's right. I mean, we're not listening to you anymore. Sorry, we're out. <laughs> already by the mid 19th century, we were able to take on, we could have taken on any European power on their own terms. Um, and we don't look at the Civil War. I mean, we, we had, what an army we put together. It would have been a, just a matter of time, I think. So as we come to the conclusion of the text, I've jumped over the grievances. There's this, there's a paragraph here. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. We are touching on this again and again, but I guess the first is the notion that they're a free people. Yeah. And we've talked about this already, but but well, again, English, I come uh, back to it. They were always talk, they were a free people, because England's, the English are a free people. I mean, the whole debate, right up to really the end, they talk in terms of, we're the defenders of the English Constitution. It's a curious revolution in that sense. It's undertaken on behalf of the, an uncorrupted English Constitution. That they are a free people, just as the English used to be. But now, we are the, the free Englishmen. We're, we're saving you from your own corrupt, uh, system. And so th they don't see themselves until the very end as needing to be independent. They're defending themselves as Englishmen. And in fact, you, could, you make a case, and they, they understood the irony of this, that we're, we're revolting on behalf of the English Constitution. And it's a curious kind of thing. They have to drop it. When they, they, they're talking about English rights, all of their rights. And, and the English had this tremendous tradition of rights. I mean, the Bill of Rights the first Bill of Rights that we talk about is, seven, is 1688. Glorious revolution. It's, they get a Bill of Rights against the crown. The only thing that's unique in, about American rights is the right of religion, because the English keep an established church. But all the other rights, jury trial, all that stuff that's in the Ten Amendments, the Bill of Rights, are English rights. We've talked about this already. but So the, 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 there's this interesting identity question. Especially when you think about that these Read Americans... the last pa pa uh, of the declaration, the last sentence of the declaration. It tells, oh. a lot, tells you a lot. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. To each other. There's no nation that they can appeal to. There's no patria, there's no fatherland. They have themselves <laughs> they're appealing to. It's kind of, when you think about it, it's kind of sad. They, they really, they're sort of inventing the nation. There is no nation. There's these 13 states. And, and it's not quite clear that each of those states doesn't have the right to find, form alliances and do these things as independent states could do. It, it's unclear, isn't it? It doesn't say that they collectively have that right. They're saying these are 13 states that have the right to form alliances and be, be you know, internationally potent. This is really interesting, too, when you, you know, because as you described it, and when we were talking about the concept of the state and this word state, yeah. Pennsylvania is big. Pennsylvania could be a, a country. Of course. And so could Virginia. And so That's could right. North Carolina and Georgia. These, are pla these can all be countries uh, in, in comparison. And they are, you know, like the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The com they, three of them, I think, choose the term Commonwealth, which is interesting. Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Virginia to kind of go back to their republic the ancient republic uh, origins. This is gonna bridge into the next part of the conversation really well, which is about slavery. You have 56 signers of the Declaration. 
How are they chosen? How does it come to be this group of people in particular? Well, they're selected by each state. They were delegates. Each colony had one vote, but they could send delegations of seven or eight or two or three or whatever. So that's how they get in there. The mechanics of this are really interesting because you don't have the telephone. <laughs> you mean you don't have any means of communication other than sending a letter by horseback, basically, right? right? Exactly. That'd be so, the fastest. So letter by horseback, fast, fastest way to communicate. Vast landmass of these right. thirteen colonies, and yet they, there's this thing that is referenced in the text called in general Congress. So what does that mean? What is the General Congress? Well, the Congress that had met, the Continental Congress, as we call it. That's, this was the second Continental Congress. It began in May of 75, and it was still in existence. And they, What's that word mean, Congress? Because well, it's, not, so it's not the it's U.S. House. It's coming right? together of, of separate states, like the Congress of Vienna, which settled the Napoleonic Wars. It's a collection of, of states. Keep in mind, these are independent states. Look, more people... Those people who met, more of them had been to London than had been to Philadelphia. That, what, that unifies, tells you something about what unifies them all right. is, their, mean, is their Englishness, their Britishness. Right, right. But they were suspicious of each other. I mean, Adams wonders about these Southern slaveholders. What are they going to be like? Are they a bunch of aristocrats that uh, I would not like? You know, he's, he's pleased by it because they're very radical. It's Massachusetts <laughs> and Virginia that are the most radical colonies. The two of them really bring it about. I mean, they take the lead. So this moves us into uh, this question of slavery. Right. And this weird, the weirdness of this from a modern context. Of course. So here you have this declaration. And you just brought up Massachusetts. So I want to just read, read something, a, a couple things I, I gathered. So one was that John Adams, you know, in Massachusetts, had called slavery a foul contagion in the human character and an evil of colossal magnitude. This is one of our founding fathers. And yet, you know, the Declaration calls all men are created equal, but some of them own slaves. You know, pre you know obviously Thomas Jefferson. You've alluded to this earlier that an early draft of the Declaration actually had an right. argument but blaming and, George III for slavery. My understanding of the passage was basically he's saying, look, you are trying, you're now as part of your shenanigans, trying to stoke a slave revolt. That certainly goes back to the Virginia governor in November of 1775, uh, issues a proclamation offering freedom to any slave who will escape from his plantation and come to the crown. He's sitting on a ship in Chesapeake Bay. Hannah Jones, in collaboration with another historian, ha has made a lot of this. This is what really creates the, the revolution in Virginia. This is November of 75. The reason that governor is sitting on a ship in Chesapeake Bay is because the patriots have taken over the government completely. The revolution is over, in, in, in that sense, in Virginia. So this is not the stir, stirring it up. 300 slaves do run to the crown. They don't get quite what they expected. Some of them end up, I think, being sold to the West Indies. But nonetheless, they, there are 300 who come. But that's, not the, that's hardly the cause of the revolution. Britain wasn't planning to free the slaves. On the contrary, it's, it's Americans with the Declaration of Independence, with this independence, that free the slaves in the northern states. Every northern state immediately begins moving against slavery, including Virginia, even though Virginia has a real problem because 40% of its population is enslaved. Now, in the northern states, there's nothing like that. Maybe 12% in New York, 14%, I think, in New York City. I think my own state of Rhode Island had maybe even as many as 12%, but Massachusetts had 3%. Tiny amounts, but nonetheless, it's a legally established institution in all these states, and they all move against it under the impact of the revolution. We have to understand that for thousands of years, slavery existed in the, in the world without substantial criticism. None. In fact, even in the 18th century, you have voices here and there. There was Samuel Sewell in 1700, he voiced 
a Puritan. Uh, there are some Quakers. But there's no movement. There's no development. The revolution, the American Revolution, for the first time in history, history, makes slavery a problem now, it, for Western culture. This is so important for the generations to come to understand exactly. based on what's happening in our culture right. today. Right. Because to lose this is to, is to lose something so fundamental about what I believe is the miracle of the country. Right. So I want to really parse this well, and understand it. it. Again, I, I am not a historian. I have Google, though. Which should mean, which means that like more people should know these things than they do. Because well, just all have Google in our pockets. Think of it: if slavery has always existed, all of a sudden, here's the what eight states abolish it. Now, it, it, so this by is, so, 1804, it takes some years because some places they did, there was a fight. But even in Virginia, Jefferson introduces a bill even before the Revolution, 1767, to to abolish slavery in so, Virginia. He is the Enlightenment personified. He wants to do everything that's enlightened. I mean, this is why he, he, has, he draws up uh, bills having to do with, uh, with criminal punishment. He does, he's religious. His, his bill for religious freedom is 1779 is extraordinary. I mean, nothing like it in the history of the world. Separation of church and state. There's no, no state in the world that's even thinking like that. We're gonna have no state involvement with religion. If religion is important, then the state must be involved in it, right? I mean, that's the way it goes. If the, and so for Jefferson to, to make this bill separating them, there, there, this was, nobody else was doing that. I mean, we, even the other states were abolishing the Church of England, but they weren't necessarily saying you shouldn't have religion being supported by public money. Jefferson's cutting off all support. There's no yeah. way where in Europe that that's happening. So, you have to understand how radical these things are. Look, the first anti-slave convention in the history of the world occurred in Philadelphia in 1775. It's not coincidental that it came with a revolution. The revolution is about enacting the Enlightenment. What enlightened people want the world to be like. And they have a chance to do this with this revolution. That's, it, it, that's Jefferson he, in particular. Now, he's a complicated character because yes. he's holding slaves. Why didn't he, he just he, set him free? Why is it just like walk he, the walk? He financially couldn't. He just is unable. Washington is much more serious about it, and Washington works to free his slaves and does uh, before he dies. He puts them, in, you know, he frees them. Uh, but it's complicated because he, but he provides for their education. He's not just going to throw them out in the world with them. He, so they have to remain uh, trained in some craft. Jefferson is, 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 doesn't have the wealth. Washington's wealthy enough. Jefferson is so deeply in debt. I mean, here's a guy who's writing John Adams and saying, look, you're raising money from the Dutch you know, for, uh, for us in the 1780s. Could you raise some money for me? So I, I need to buy some books. You know, he's borrowing <laughs> money to buy books. And what kind of a, you know, he's just, it doesn't absolve him, but... No, it doesn't. But and I say that not because I'm modern, but just because he, 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 he clearly understood that this is a he, problem. He knew it was wrong. But what important point to realize that almost every one of these leaders realizes that slavery is wrong. Patrick Henry voices it. He says, I know it's wrong. I shouldn't. This is 17. Why? He Why does this group of people come together they in know this that country the now? People are telling them that slavery is one of those things that has to be eliminated. Like, you have to reform criminal punishment. You have to get rid of established churches. They're being told these, we know what that is. When I, people come in and tell you what's, what's the enlightened thing to do, that's what they're being told. And so Henry knows that. And he says, I know I should do something. I just can't live without him. I, I need him. That's, he comes to that kind of, it, it's kind of sad. It's sad. There are people, of course, in South Carolina and Georgia who are saying, even the leaders, who are saying, no, we, we're going to keep it. We need it. I mean, they know the source of their wealth. And then, of course, there are right. ordinary people who are saying, hey, don't cut it out just before. We haven't had a chance to get slaves yet. There's a yeah. large number of people at the second, third levels who want to keep slavery. But we're talking about the enlightened elite, almost uniformly, with exception of the Deep South, 
are willing to try it. In, in, in Virginia, you have a lot of men. They pass a new manumissions law, making it easier to free slaves. Uh, there's a kind of hopefulness that runs through the period. It gets killed. You can almost date it from the outbreak of the Haitian Rebellion in 1790s. You wrote in your book, The Creation of the American Republic, quote, the Constitution was a compromise on the issue of slavery, recognizing its existence, but also laying out the groundwork for its eventual abolition. You've made the case that the Revolution and Declaration set America to lead the world on this track. Exactly, and the promise of entering the international slave trade. We're the first to do that, too. The Brits come very close, but we were first. And the promise is there, and the, and the southern states say, oh, give us 20 years more. And uh, otherwise, we would have done it right away. So, this international slave. See, the Virginians don't need slaves. That's one of the reasons why Virginia uh, is willing to, to take the lead on this. Which area was more wealthy, <laughs> the north or the south? The north. When Tocqueville <laughs> comes and he goes to the Ohio River, and he compares Ohio with Kentucky, which is a slave, has slavery. Uh, there's no, he just, it's clear that Ohio is a flourishing place. And, and Jefferson knows this too. His uh, daughter marries a, a, a New Englander and he goes up there and she writes him, what a place this is, <laughs> you know. And he knows something, he's been to New England briefly, he knows, he has a kind of New England complex. That's where he talks about the ward system, and he loved those little towns, and he just wishes, he just wishes, he yearns that Virginia could be like New England, without slaves, with these flourishing villages. There's just no doubt of it that the North is really booming. It is, and there's just no doubt when the war occurred, there's, the North was going to win. But yeah. you can see the North is definitely well, in terms of wealth, and there's no comparison. When I was going to film school, this movie came out with these young hot shots uh, of, Holly, of, of who would soon be titans of Hollywood. It was called Goodwill Hunting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and in this movie, <laughs> a young Turk, uh, sort of a brilliant guy, is Matt, you Damon's, know, Matt character. Damon's character. You know, he talks about, oh, yeah, I read Gordon Wood. And then he references Howard Zinn as the sort of contra to Gordon Wood. Zinn was a friend of the family. Of, of your family? No. Oh, of his David's family. family. Yeah, yeah. They grew up near, near each other. And so he, he makes Zinn the, the ultimate hero. Uh, yeah, no. I've heard folks who are very sort of, um, I'd say, like, right of center politically, but also, like, really into the Constitution who demonized Zen and his people's history of the United States. I, I am always leery of these sorts of things when I don't understand it, but help me understand what, what is, we were just talking Zin, about Zin's history. Zen's an old fashioned Marxist and he, he simply, his history became quite popular yeah. and used in high schools, I guess, all, all over the country. The people's history. <laughs> the people's history. And he, he ref referenced every kind of revolt from below, every strike, everything. And it was always an economic kind of exploitation being persisted. Was it good history? I, I, I can't confess that I've read the book. Okay. I dipped into it. I know it. And it's not wrong in the sense that each one of those episodes occurred. It's a question of whether, is that the story, the full story, that we, we've just been a, a, a bunch of, you know, if you're, I suppose, a devout Marxist, then capitalism is, is a series of, of evils that have occurred. But I don't think that's a, a full story. It come, you come away with it, the America must be a terrible place, all this exploitation, and you've got to see the whole, and I don't think that he does. I'm navigating the world as a citizen, and I, I am told a story, a historical story. How sh where should I, where, what should my starting point be? It's hard be? to know. At some point, you're going to have to, if you really want to know, you have to read a, enough history so that you get a more balanced view. Uh, that's the only solution I could think of. But it's very difficult, especially in the modern world with the media. So all kinds of stories will fly around. And the main thing is you want to understand how did we, you start with a very different world, a foreign country back there, yeah. different. How did they get to be us? And that's, that's the movement. That's the, the theme you want to have. 
Uh, and it, it involves a lot of things, including a civil war uh, that was fought on, 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 on the issue of slavery. Um, it's a very, we have a, an extraordinary rich history. We're in very difficult times, it feels like. But I feel like everybody's had difficult times, you know. Uh, and yet I think that there's something happening right now, and we were talking about it before the camera started to roll, just about the institutions. We have this constitution that has set up these institutions. And I worry about how these will persist and you know, can the America that works continue to work inside of this framework that the founding documents have set yeah, up for yeah. us? How do you think about this? As we come up on the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, how, how much optimism do you have that we've got another 250 in us? Well, I, you know, we've had difficult times in the past, including a civil war. What's different, which really uh, scares me, is, is the lack of confidence in the, in the country's future uh, among elites. They, they don't seem confident. I mean, that just is new. Americans went through the Civil War. They went through all kinds of changes that took place. In the, uh, you know, 100 years ago, there was this tremendous crisis over immigration. But there was an underlying confidence that the country would be great. We could handle it. It, it just. That's what's lacking, I think, this confidence. And that's not easily reversed. You just hope that uh, somehow people come to realize that you're living in the country. Why not feel good about it and do something? If you, if you don't like it, then, then make, make changes. But the, all those reformers in the past, the progressive generation, they didn't lose confidence. Charles Beard was a great historian who wrote the book that changed uh, our attitude towards the Constitution. He, 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 he admired the founders. He, he was confident America was great, but the present uh, critics don't feel that way. There is this thing that seems to, there's a thing that has, I have observed it change, which is in my adult life, I'm 45 years old, and so I've had a couple decades of being what, a functional adult, <laughs> and, and I have seen the change from if you claimed and that, that the other side of the political aisle wasn't patriotic or didn't love the country or, or was anti-American, that was repudiated by the charged. So yeah. if Republicans said, you know, Democrats hate America, they're not patriotic or vice versa, the other side was quick to say, I love this country. And the, and the, and the, and the people that would be running for office, that, that would be the first go-to. How dare you say such a thing? I love this country. That's why I'm fighting for my beliefs, because I think they'll make the country better. I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not straw manning when I say I do believe we have crossed some threshold now where at least, maybe not politicians, although some, it's the most radical sounding, they're willing to say, no, the country's rotten. The country needs to be reconstructed from the bottom up because it's so deeply rotten. And that is different. That feels different to me. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And someone mentioned earlier about politicians accusing each other of lying. That's a really different thing from saying, I disagree with your opinion. Your opinion's wrong and you're wrong-headed. But to say you're lying, uh, that, that's a more serious charge because it means that you, you're going at the motive of the person. He's not really telling the truth because he wa wants to distort the truth. It's kind of a symptom of the, of, of the decay of our politics. For the young people who, who hopefully get a chance to watch this, maybe with their dad, yeah. <laughs> maybe forced by their dad, but that's a sign of a good dad if they're forced to watch this conversation. What's your message to my son's generation, to this up and coming generation, Gen Z or Zoomers, the coming alphas well, about America? You know, if you had to get some perspective on it and say, what's the most important event that's occurred in the last 400 years? It has to be the creation of the United States. Now, for good or for ill, it's a great saga. Think of it, starting with a little colony in 1607 of a dozen people, 20, 30 people. And from that, you grow to be the greatest, most powerful nation in the, ever in the history of the world. If you don't like the story, OK. But think about it as a, as a saga, as a story. It makes the rise and fall of Rome seemed tame by comparison to the rise of the British Empire, the Ottoman Empire, nothing compared to
to the story of the United States over the last 400 years. It's just incredible. And think of it in those terms. As a historian, it becomes a fantastic story. Now you can emphasize different things. A lot happened in it. We are the most diverse country the world has ever known. There are empires that were diverse, the Ottoman Empire, or the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. But as a nation, the whole world is here. And they all want to come here. So we can't be all that bad if so many people want to come. So what is it that, that this attracts those people and has attracted them? In the 19th century, 35 million people from Europe came here. Uh, I mean, we had no visa requirements. They just came because yeah. I heard this place, I could make some money. Some of them came and went back home, but they came because there they were opportunities here that they didn't have in their home, in their home country. It seems to me when you look at this just in the terms of, of the magnitude of the events, uh, compared to anything that's happened in the history of the whole world, you have to be impressed by it. A and whether you like it or dislike it, you have to confront it and, and come to terms with it. If you want to know what's going on in the world, just kind of understand that, that, that massive event. I just think it's extraordinary story. I can't think of any more important event in the last 400 years. It's such a great reminder. It's so simple to just look at who's knocking at your door as a sign. Right, it is right. really hard to, I, find, I feel like it's a hard thing to refute. That's How right. bad could the country be? Right. If people are getting in boats and knocking down doors and climbing over half-built walls right. to come into the country. It, it is impressive. We do have the whole world here. There's, I can't think of any, any country that doesn't have some representation here in the country. How do you see your role and the role perhaps of, us, of historians in general, but especially your role as a historian in the American story? Oh, I have a little piece of it that I tell, and uh, that's all I can do. I mean, I, that's my craft, that's my vocation. I just uh, tell my little part of that story, although I like focusing on the revolution because it's by far the most important event in this story because it, it, it legally created the United States and infused into our culture everything we value, our highest noble ideals, equality, liberty. So my little part is a very important part of that story, but I, I only have a, a section of it, a little part of it. Gordon Wood, thank you for being on Dad Saves America. I've, I've learned a lot in this conversation. It really, it really has been incredible. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gordon Wood. We'll put links to his numerous books down below. And thank you to our friends at Liberty Fund who made this interview possible. My key takeaway from this conversation was the importance of exploring our history with an open mind, but not an ax to grind. Our country's history is complex and deeply compromised by the legacy of slavery. It's a sin whose scars are still with us to this day. But it's also a story of humanity's greatest ideals, life, liberty, universal human dignity, being made manifest for the first time on a massive scale. If we want to preserve our freedoms and improve our society, we need to understand our history and work hard to see it without the biases of politically tinted glasses. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends and family. And be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes that play an essential role in overcoming the challenges we all face together. And now, we leave you with a dad win of historic proportions. America, we are the great... Oh, shit. Oh, shit.